Hello again. So uh, it's time to start our third lecture of the semester online. And uh, today what we're going to start talking about is monitors and diagnosis. So I've put some slides. I'm going to hear, I'm going to open Blackboard for you and uh, let you see. You may have already seen these. Uh, just pick the OB section. Uh, under lessons, I have, it says slides for week 11. Um, so that's what we're going to start working on. And uh, here it is. So monitors and diagnosis. You know, this course is supposed to be about all computer systems, not just engine controls, not just powertrain management, but analog brakes, um, you know, electronic suspension systems, climate control, anything that's electronically controlled. The most information, though, uh, comes from electronic engine controls or powertrain management because that's where most of the requirements, you know, EPA requirements and things like that are. When you, uh, when you do a New York State inspection on your car, for example, New York State doesn't care about your HVAC system. So uh, the monitors that we're going to talk about really are just, they're just exclusive to powertrain management and not ABS and things like that, at least for now. Who knows? Maybe someday... Um, we'll have all kinds of different monitors for other systems. So, you know, what I just said, though, there is one little caveat. Uh, one monitor that we're going to mention, the comprehensive component monitor, is the computer watching various readings and things like that all the time and flagging problems. And that does happen on pretty much every electronic system. But the monitors we're talking about in this particular presentation are OBD2 monitors, you know, onboard diagnostics monitors that were essentially mandated um, by the government. So if we look, first thing we're going to talk about is two different types of diagnosis. Now, um, manual diagnosis, mostly what I'm talking about when I talk about manual diagnosis you have uh, a diagnostic trouble code and you've followed some sort of a chart or some sort of a testing procedure that has led you to check the resistance of some circuit or the voltage available somewhere or to look at something manually with a uh, digital volt ohm meter. You might be working with wiring diagrams you may need to understand how the circuit works in order to do this kind of diagnosis. However, there's also manual diagnosis that involves a scan tool. I'll give you an example. Uh, an EVAP code, right? You've all seen this. You get an EVAP code, small leak, large leak. Uh, so the code represents onboard diagnosis, right? The, so the vehicle has recognize some sort of a problem, it's given you a diagnostic trouble code, and now it's up to you to figure out the source or the cause of that diagnostic trouble code to narrow it down or pinpoint the problem. Um, but you may be using a scan tool to do that. So if we talk about that EVAP code, you've all seen this, uh, one of you know many possible examples, you use the scan tool to seal the system. You know, to close the vent solenoid, it's a normally open solenoid, right? The scan tool energizes it, closes it. And it also makes sure that the purge solenoid is not open. That's normally closed, so it just doesn't energize that. And then you've got an EVAP system seal, and you're using a smoke machine or a pressure tester of some sort then to pressurize or fill the system with smoke. But the scan tool is necessary for this, right? So it's manual diagnosis, but you're still using a scan tool. 
Uh, another example, and this is not just powertrain, but you may, uh, let, let's say you have a problem with a power window. Is it the window motor? Is it the window switch? Is it the body control module? You don't know. So maybe you're plugging a scan tool in and you're reading the data from that, say, BCM or maybe a driver's door module, whatever. It, you know, there's so many different configurations on different cars over the years, it's impossible to generalize. But some sort of module is monitoring that uh, window switch. So it could be a driver's door module or it could just be a BCM. You, uh, you may have the scan tool connected into that module. You're watching data on the screen while you manually operate the switch and look on the scan tool screen to see if the status of that switch changes. So if you're watching the scan tool screen, you push the switch to the down position and the status of the switch on the scan tool screen changes from nothing or neutral uh, to down. And then you push the switch to the up position and you see on the scan tool screen that the switch is now indicating up. That tells you a lot, right? It tells you the switch is working. And it tells you that the wiring from the switch to the module is working. And it tells you that the module is capable of uh, receiving that information from the switch. Next, uh, same exact problem. You might take the scan tool and go into the, a mode where you can control things. So, you know, active command modes. And you might use the scan tool to see if you can energize the window motor. You've seen it, you know, uh, we've used the Y-Tech, we've used the Ford one, we've used the Autel to, you know, beep the horn or raise the RPM, turn the wipers on and off. So you might use the scan tool to see if the, if the window motor itself works. So you're using a scan tool, but the diagnosis is completely manual. You're, you're in the driver's seat. You're the one that is uh, doing the diagnosis. So onboard diagnostics, on the other hand, uh, the computer itself is doing the diagnostics. So um, this is built into the computers. It's got nothing to do with the scan tool. As the vehicle is driving down the road, it's constantly monitoring itself and diagnosing itself. So um, initially we had OBD-1. We did not call it OBD-1, uh, onboard diagnostics. You know, we just called it OBD until OBD-2 came out in about 1996. And then, you know, we called it OBD-2. So now we have both, we have OBD-1 and OBD-2. So OBD-1 was really concerned about things not working, things actually stopping uh, emissions failures. So if you had a, uh, let's say a, a failure of uh, a sensor of some sort, temperature sensor, and the reading went way out of range, you know, where it considered normal reading was maybe, uh, you know, 10 below zero to 200 degrees or something like that. And the thing reads negative 40 or it reads, you know, three or 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's outside that range that the uh, computer is expecting. That's a, a failure. And it would uh, flag that, turn on a checked engine light. But it was never really checking the performance of emission control systems. And so this is where the EPA, you know, they came out and they said, uh, you car manufacturers now, it's not good enough just to see if something breaks. Uh, we have to make sure things are still working years later. So, how, you know, how did that happen? If you were a tech in 1990 and a car came in with a plugged catalytic converter, it was not legal, not saying it was legal, but if you removed that converter and replaced it with a straight pipe, or if you removed that converter, knocked the insides out of it to make it hollow and bolted it back in place, 
Uh, that would fix the symptom, right? The symptom of a plug catalytic converter would be a severe lack of power. Uh, by replacing it or hollowing it out, the symptom would go away. So the customer would be happy and nobody would be the wiser. You know, the uh, um, check engine light would never go on. Uh, the, the customer certainly isn't going to notice anything. In New York State, uh, could be a problem if you replace the converter with a straight pipe, that would be a problem because starting in 1984, inspectors in New York State are supposed to look at the emission control systems and see if they look like they work, right? So, you know, eyeball it. Is the, is the catalytic converter on the car? Um, but there's no requirement for that tech, that inspector, to make sure the thing's working. So if it's hollow from the outside, it looks fine. Uh, the inside, there's nothing there. It's actually not doing anything. So uh, this is what kind of led, you know, the EPA to insist on these monitors. So the monitors, uh, and, and I have a list of them in a minute, but the monitors ensure that these emission control systems are still controlling emissions, you know, one year, two years, five years, 10 years down the road. Uh, shortly after that, New York State, came out and added to their New York State inspection um, where you had to plug in New York VIP, they call it, where you had to plug into the data link connector of the vehicle and make sure the vehicle doesn't have any diagnostic trouble codes. And if too many monitors had not completed, it'll fail inspection. So, um, you know, first it was the feds, and then New York State. So now we're in a situation where for most people, you know, unless you find a way around it, if something goes wrong with your uh, evaporative emission system or with your catalytic converter, you're gonna be compelled to have it fixed because you won't be able to get an inspection sticker, at least not legally. Um, and the car will be driving around with a check engine light on. So, uh, you know, another example, we go to the EVAP monitor. Uh, before OBD2, uh, a rotted out filler neck, you know, I don't mean one that allows uh, gasoline to dump on the ground while you're filling the vehicle, but one that just is perforated a little bit, maybe up at the top, or uh, a charcoal canister that's cracked, uh, broken, uh, hoses that have dry rotted and cracked that um, allow fuel vapors out into the atmosphere, probably not noticed by the, the driver of the vehicle. So, you know, it, it's not really going to cause any kind of a drivability symptom. So the only symptom really might be a fuel smell. And that's not too, not too often even that. So most likely, what most likely would happen uh, prior to OBD2 is get a bad gas cap or something like that, fuel vapors would escape into the atmosphere. The, the customer would have absolutely no idea that was happening. There would be no light come on on the dashboard. Uh, so the vehicle would drive around like that for the next 15 years until it lands in a junkyard and never be repaired. So that was the whole reason behind OBD2 and these monitors that we're gonna talk about forces the car to continuously, well not continuously, occasionally uh, check for proper operation of these uh, emission control systems. And if they're not working right, cause the check engine light to come on so the customer is aware of it. And then hopefully, you know, they'll bring it in and have it repaired to get the light out. So that's all onboard diagnostics, though. Onboard diagnostics one and onboard diagnostics two, which is done by the vehicle computer, not by a tech or by the scan tool. So, um, you know, we'll we'll talk about OBD one and then OBD two. And so, what are we now? We're in 2020. Uh, you know, so it's been 24 years since OBD2 came along, it might seem ridiculous to mention it. Um, 
most cars nowadays you're you're not going to see but uh you're not going to see obd1 at all and, and that you know that would be a fair thing to say uh the reason i talk about obd1 is that obd2 is a superset in other words they didn't take things away they had onboard diagnostics and then when obd2 came along it just increased the scope of it you know things were added on things were not uh, taken away so much so Early on, you know, this bottom point here, we're going to understand self-test capabilities and shortcomings. Uh, we can concentrate on manual diagnosis. So, you know, what are the capabilities? What are the shortcomings? Uh, the, the shortcomings are getting fewer and fewer as the years go on. I can tell you that uh, it was very easy to fool the vehicle onboard diagnostics years ago and not necessarily intentionally that's not what i'm saying but here's an example uh, you get a little bit low on coolant in the old days you'll get a code uh, for the engine coolant temperature sensor so that seems to be pointing at the sensor or the sensor wiring or something like that in reality there was nothing wrong with the sensor there was nothing wrong with the computer system this was a basic mechanical problem uh, you have a coolant leak. And so um, I know in my family we had a 2003 Jetta. And uh, it was purchased not new, but maybe uh, maybe a year or two old. Anyhow, it was, it was new enough that it was still covered under the new vehicle emission warranty at the time. And so... When the check engine light came on, um, back then, so this was probably around 2005, I'm going to say, um, at the school, we didn't really have really good equipment for checking European vehicles. You know, we're much better now. Um, so I was able to pull the code, you know, and the code was for a coolant temperature sensor. So... Um, that's as far as I went. The vehicle is under warranty. I'm not going to fix it. Why should we pay money to fix it when it's under warranty? So I just wanted to know. It was more curiosity, you know. So um, I took that information, you know, and just stashed it away uh, for future reference and sent the car to the dealer. So the car went into the dealer and uh, they replaced the engine coolant temperature sensor and they sent it back to us and so everything seemed wonderful for uh i don't remember a week two weeks light pops back on i check it's the same code so send it back to the dealer uh, the dealer puts in a second engine coolant temperature sensor is that possible too bad coolant temperature sensors yeah it is. I once replaced a thermostat three times before I got a good one. Um, but is it likely? No, it's, it's not really likely. Um, it, it can happen. You can have new parts that are bad. So they replaced coolant temperature sensor a second time, cleared the code, sent the car back out. And, you know, you can guess, right? What happened is the uh, coolant temperature or the, the check engine light came on again. And so this time they had the history of, you know, twice replacing the engine coolant temperature sensor. And to their credit, um, they didn't put a third engine coolant temperature sensor in it. This time they replaced the, uh, the electrical connector to it, which it's a little annoying because that also didn't fix it. And now instead of the factory wiring, now you have these wires that have been cut and spliced and uh, soldered, certainly not as bulletproof as, as the uh, original, but you know, it never, that never was a problem in the future. I mean, we had the car for a long time after that, but uh, so, so two engine coolant temperature sensors and a pigtail, you know, a harness connector for it and the vehicle Again, after a short period of time, whether it was days or a week or whatever, I don't remember, 
uh, the check engine light came back on. So, you know, this time I decided uh, I was going to get a little bit more involved in it. So uh, I, I think we had uh, the Rostec software, you know, and uh, I was able to watch the coolant temperature reading on the scan tool. And for those of you that have also taken heating and air conditioning or that are currently in heating and air conditioning, you know that it's pretty typical uh, for engine coolant temperature to go up close to 200 degrees, you know, maybe, maybe 195 or so uh, before the thermostat opens. And then uh, depending on other conditions, like whether the vehicle is running down the road or whether it's sitting inside or how hot it is outside, depending on things like that, you know, the temperature, once the thermostat opens, the temperature might not get any higher. It might continue to rise, and then the cooling fan kicks on, usually somewhere around 212, something like that. Uh, but this vehicle, it topped out at about 170 degrees Fahrenheit. So as I watched the engine coolant temperature sensor, you know, the car sitting there running, it went up, you know, 140, 150, 160, 170, and then that's as far as it went. So... What does that tell you? You know, I know what it tells me. It tells me that the vehicle's not reaching operating temperature. And what can cause that? Pretty much the only thing that's gonna cause that is that the thermostat is not fully closing or it's opening too soon. So I replaced the thermostat on the vehicle and the, the problem never came back. So did the self-test from Volkswagen from 2003, the onboard diagnostics, did it tell us that there was a problem uh, with the engine not reaching temperature? No, it did not. It just said coolant temperature sensor fault. Um, now, in contrast, if you take a 2012-2015 vehicle, that is a code that it's really highly likely you could see. If it has a bad thermostat, the trouble code description literally says um, engine not reaching operating temperature. And so it does not send you into really checking for a problem with the sensor so much. It has you check to see if the engine's reaching operating temperature by some other means, you know, with thermometers uh, or whatever it takes. And that would lead you to the thermostat almost right away, as opposed to having to replace sensors and replace wiring harness things. So, uh, Definitely self-test has shortcomings. It's not perfect, but it is definitely getting better. So we flip to the next slide here, right? We have some different terms to talk about. Um, first thing, DTC. So this is a diagnostic trouble code. Uh, they are alphanumeric. So generally they start with a letter and then they have digits following them. And these are codes that are set and or displayed when the vehicle self-test detects a fault. Um, we have different kinds of faults. So th these, this is kind of manufacturer dependent, all right? So, excuse me. Um, I'm using the term soft fault. Um, but... Different manufacturers, you know, uh, use different terminology. And I'll try to I'll try to mention that as we go along, right? But a soft fault, what I'm calling a soft fault, it's a condition that causes a diagnostic trouble code to be set in the computer memory, but the problem might not be there anymore, or it might come and go. It might be intermittent. Let me give you a perfect example. I fill up my gas tank. I don't get the gas cap on correctly. I take the vehicle out and drive it. So what happens? The EVAP monitor fails. And um, at some point, the check engine light comes on. So now I'm driving around with my check engine light on. And, uh, you know, I've used a lot of gas at this point. So I pull back into the gas station. I refill the tank. I put the uh, gas cap on correctly this time. In the meantime, 
Well, my light was on. I made an appointment with the dealership and said, I have a check engine light. And so they, my appointment's tomorrow, right? Now, what caused the check engine light to come on? The loose gas cap caused the check engine light to come on. When I bring this vehicle to the dealership tomorrow, is the gas cap going to be loose? Exactly. It's not. Is the dealer going to find a problem with this vehicle when they look at it tomorrow? Absolutely not. So this is a problem that existed at some point. Now it's gone. Here's another example of an intermittent problem. I have a, a loose connection, right? And it, that's kind of a really generic term. So we give an example. Uh, some tech in the past during diagnosis pulled a connector off of a sensor and jammed a big fat uh, voltmeter lead into that terminal. Now that terminal is all spread out. It's bigger than it's supposed to be. When you reattach that connector, sometimes it makes contact, sometimes it doesn't. So driving down the road, sometimes it's working the way it's supposed to. Sometimes it's not working the way it's supposed to. So eventually now a check engine light comes on. When this uh, vehicle gets diagnosed, maybe as it's sitting there in the stall, in the service stall, and the tech's looking at it, maybe the problem exists right then. Maybe the connection is bad. Or maybe the problem doesn't exist. Maybe the connection is good. And, and soft faults, right, so they're intermittent. Um, they happened at some point, they may or may not, the condition may or may not still exist when you're looking at it. These are the biggest nightmare in diagnostics because you can have a car in front of you in the shop that has absolutely no problem right this minute, but it had it yesterday or last week. And, you know, the light might still be on. They don't go off instantaneously when you fix a problem unless you actually use a scan tool and clear that code and turn the light off. So that's a soft fault. And they're, you know, intermittent problems usually. Uh, the other term, of course, is hard fault. Now, a hard fault doesn't mean, okay, so it doesn't mean it's hard to fix. That's not what the term hard fault means. But what it means is the, the problem is not intermittent, right? The problem exists right now. So if I took a pair of side cutters and I walked out and I cut the wire off of one of your fuel injectors, that problem is there. It's going to be there. It ain't fixing itself. And when, when the car comes in the shop, the tech is going to be able to see there's a problem there. Uh, you'll have that misfire. You won't get the correct signal to that injector. Um, a lot easier to find and fix. Now, normally, uh, cars that come in your bay, the problem is not that somebody took a pair of side cutters and chopped a wire. But I have seen, um, I've seen animals do it, right? I, I had this conversion van, uh, went to Allegheny State Park. Uh, my brother-in-law had a cabin there, you know, parked the vehicle there overnight, spent the night there. And uh, as we were leaving, the ABS light came on. Like, that was weird, you know, it was fine all the way down there and all we did was park the vehicle and now all of a sudden there's a problem with it. Uh, turned out that uh, some sort of critter, I don't know what kind of critter, chewed through one of the wheel speed sensor wires overnight while the vehicle sat there. Um, so, you know, it was a midnight snack for some sort of rodent. I've also seen, uh, you know, Critters, we had a Toyota pickup, and the knock sensors are under the intake manifold, under the plenum, and uh, knock sensor code, and found a um, big mouse nest under the plenum, and, of course, the wires were eaten. We had a, a Oldsmobile, if you remember that brand, uh, that belonged to the school, that critters ate all of the injector wires. I, I don't know what was so tasty about those wires, but... You know, so those are really, really obvious hard faults. That's not the only kind of hard fault there is, that somebody ate your wires. So what's an example of another hard fault? 
Uh, with the EVAP monitor failing, I talked about in the past, uh, you know, well, a little while ago, I talked about getting the gas cap on wrong. Um, you know, that could be an intermittent thing if it then is put on right. But what if the filler neck rots out? You know, so it's rotted now. It's going to be rotted tomorrow. It's going to be rotted the next day. Uh, if that vehicle is in your bay and you smoke it, you're going to see smoke coming out that filler neck. That's a problem that exists. You know, you're going to be able to find it, right? It didn't fix itself. So that's the difference between a hard fault and a soft fault. Hard fault, the, the fault's still going to be there when you're uh, working on the vehicle. Soft fault, maybe, maybe not. You don't know. Um, on the YTEC, if you look, Chrysler, uh, the term they use for hard fault is active. It's an active uh, DTC. And for a soft fault, they call it a stored one. Um, uh, Ford, they have what they call on-demand codes, which are codes basically you do an on-demand self-test and it says, yep, there's a problem right now. And there are continuous codes. So continuous codes are part of the continuous self-test. So as it was driving down the road at some point, something failed and set that code. GM, I'm forgetting exactly what they call them. But um, they, they all have, you know, terminology for the concept of a soft fault versus a hard fault. So a pinpoint test. Uh, these are manual tests that you do with meters and flow charts or possibly a scan tool. We mentioned that before. And it's usually indicated by a di diagnostic trouble code. So, you know, the way this works, right, is car comes in, it has a symptom or it has a light on. You plug in a scan tool, you read the codes, you see a code, uh, and that directs you into some sort of diagnostic. So I, I know I'm going to do this again, but just, you know, briefly, uh, if I go to all data here, right, and I pick a vehicle, so 2010 uh, Chevy. I'm kind of trying to stick with the same vehicle all the time. And I go to uh, code charts, right? And I'll pick the uh, P0172, right? So this is a uh, fuel system rich, you know. And so it gives you all kinds of information here. We'll talk about this in more detail, but... Uh, you know, it talks about how this system works. Uh, it tells you what causes the code to set. You know, here's what has to happen before uh, that self-test will run, you know. And uh, just some examples, right? Uh, it won't even run it if the fuel level is less than 10%. You know, it won't run it if, uh, if you're less than negative 36 degrees Fahrenheit, you know. Um, to set the, the code, you know, it's above a certain fuel trim for more than three minutes after you meet all these conditions here, right? So once the vehicle's warmed up and all that kind of stuff. And uh, here's what it takes to make the code go away, and we're going to talk about this some more. But, uh, you know, here's the pinpoint test, right? So the circuit or system testing, right? So it's telling you, you know, check this, check that, you know. Uh, and then how to repair it, right? So this is kind of the, uh, the idea of a pinpoint test. right? So you're directed to do a pinpoint test. What you're doing is, you know, the code will tell you there's a problem with a specific system. So the, you know, lean code, for example, tells you there's a problem with fuel control. Something's gone wrong. It doesn't tell you what. So is it plugged injectors? Is it low fuel pressure? Is it a vacuum leak? You know, you don't know. Um, is there a problem with the mass airflow sensor? You don't know what it is, so the pinpoint test is designed to go from that 
you know, 10,000 foot view, right, of uh, there's a problem with the fuel control down to the individual component or connector or wire uh, that's actually causing the code to happen. A monitor um, is software. Okay, so it's software that exists inside the uh, PCM. And uh, it's, so I'll just read it, a preset diagnostic program run by the vehicle computer when the conditions are correct. So the correct conditions depend entirely on which monitor we're talking about. Uh, some monitors run more easily than others. We'll see some run all the time, you know, but uh, the two most difficult monitors to run, you know, so the ones that have the most stringent conditions, right? Um, right here, when the conditions are correct. So the ones that have the most stringent conditions are uh, probably the catalyst monitor and the EVAP monitor. Uh, the EVAP monitor is absolutely the worst. And when I say worst, what I mean is uh, it's probably the last one to run. So if I clear my codes today, I might check back a week later and that EVAP monitor hasn't run yet, even though all the other ones have. Fortunately, in New York State, you can have one monitor that hasn't run and still pass uh, inspection, but um, there are some issues where one monitor is dependent on another. So uh, if I have a problem with oxygen sensors, it fails the oxygen sensor monitor, it's not even gonna to try to run the catalyst monitor because it requires functioning oxygen sensors in order to do the catalyst monitor. So uh, this is it relatively complicated? We'll try to go through you know monitor by monitor and talk as much as we can about what's involved in making them run. So let's see, to review, soft faults are set by a self-test or monitor failure. Uh, they're stored in memory. And, you know, this is uh, keep alive memory, I've called it uh, earlier on, back when we were doing in-person lectures. So th this memory, uh, there's memory that stays when the vehicle's turned off. And it holds um, diagnostic trouble codes. It holds fuel trim numbers, you know, any kind of uh, adaptive things that the vehicle has learned. And... If you clear the codes, that wipes it out. If you unhook the battery, that wipes it out. But just shutting the vehicle off does not. Um, when the vehicle comes into your bay, the problem might no longer exist. It might be a problem that's been repaired, such as that loose gas cap I talked about. Or it might be a problem that is intermittent. Three ways we can get rid of... Uh, Diagnostic trouble code. One way we can disconnect power. Uh, we can disconnect power to the entire vehicle, right? So unhook the battery, disconnect the battery negative cable. Usually they suggest you wait a little while. Um, or you could just disconnect power to an individual module. So. Uh, if I pulled the ECM fuse, that might clear codes from the engine control module. Most people typically just, you know, they'll unhook the battery if they have to. Uh, I've seen, though, really, it was really surprising. I, I had a 2000 Taurus, and my 2000 Taurus needed a new seatbelt buckle, and... The seatbelt pretensioner on that, you know, it's part of the airbag system, part of the uh, supplemental inflatable restraint system. And uh, so the pretensioner has a little, a little, uh, I don't want to say explosive, a little charge inside it that pulls the seatbelt tight in the event of a collision at the same time the airbags go off. Uh, so they suggested before changing this seatbelt buckle because of the pretensioner, you're messing with the airbag system that you should disarm the airbags. And, and the way to disarm the airbags, of course, 
disconnect the battery and wait a while. The airbag system does have a little bit of a backup power supply. You know, why is that, right? Why does the airbag system have a backup power supply? If you're in a front end collision, usually one of the very first things to get hit is the battery. So if you take out the battery, what's going to power the airbags, right? So the airbag sensing and diagnostic module typically has a big capacitor. Uh, so that'll stay charged for several seconds. They, you know, they tell you, I, I think on this Taurus, they wanted you to unhook the battery, wait one minute or two minutes. I, I don't remember exactly how much. Um, and that should be enough to disarm the airbags. So then, so I did that. And then I, I removed the seat because you had to remove the seat. Um, and put the seat on a bench. Uh, I changed the uh, seat belt pretensioner, you know, the seat belt buckle. And I think I even, I think it was lunchtime, you know. So I think while the seat was out, I got distracted. I got called off to do something else, go eat lunch or something like that. So by the time I put that seat back in, and rehook the battery. I'm going to say that battery had been unhooked for 45 minutes, easy. Um, on that car, it did not uh, clear the codes, and it did not reset the radio presets. It, you would swear the battery was never unhooked, uh, and that. I still, to this day, I don't really understand that. So uh, disconnecting power usually works, usually does. <laughs> but that was a case where, for me, it, it did not. You know, fortunately, I wasn't really trying to clear any codes, but uh, it, was, it was really weird. It was noticeable that, that there was no reset from unhooking the battery. So um, the second method Clear the codes with a scan tool. This is probably the most common, right? You fix a problem, uh, you know, you just pick clear codes on the scan tool, bam, they're cleared. Problem solved. Or uh, you can do absolutely nothing. If the problem is gone, the code will eventually clear itself. You know, so uh, I'm going to try in the lab, I'm going to try to demo this uh, with my truck and a recorder, but you know, the way it works uh, for a lot of monitors, single failure, it just makes a note, you know. Second failure, it turns on the light, sets a code. Uh, once the problem is gone, uh, it probably has to pass that monitor multiple times before the light turns out. And then even after the light is out, uh, the, the code's still in memory for quite some time. How long? Uh, on modern vehicles, it is 40 warm-up cycles, and 40 warm-up cycles could take a couple of days. It could take months, depending on who's driving the car. So uh, we're going to talk about warm-up cycles and, and try to clarify that later on. Onboard diagnostic hard faults, of course, they're set the same way as a soft fault, right? They're, they're set by a self-test or monitor failure. Um, you know, and so they'll be stored in memory also. You know, if I plug in a scan tool and say, give me the codes that are in this vehicle's memory, it's going to give me, you know, the codes, um, but it'll probably give me some indication if they are stored or active, right? Or is... Uh, Chrysler's old way of doing it, they had something called a, a good trip counter. And if the good trip counter was zero, that means every time this vehicle runs and, you know, drives, this thing fails. We have no good trips. Uh, that's older Chrysler's. Now it just says active or stored. Like I said, Ford calls them uh, on demand or continuous. And I still don't remember what GM calls them. So uh, I... I have to refresh my memory on that. I just sky on that. So uh, if it's a hard fault, that means the problem exists right now. And the way that's cleared is you got to repair the fault and then, you know, follow any one of these um, methods that we already talked about. 
once the problem is fixed. If you clear a hard fault uh, without fixing it, well, it's going to come right back, you know. So some hard faults will come back instantaneously. I've seen that. Uh, check codes. I got a code. Clear it. Check codes. I got the same code right away, immediately. Uh, so, you know, that would be like a, a wiring problem or a flat-out failed component where the computer is able to see that the resistance or the voltage is just flat wrong. Um, but some hard faults, you clear them, they won't come back till you drive the car and that monitor runs. So, you know, the conditions for checking it haven't been met. Oh, this last statement, uh, hard fault can also be detected, detected as a soft fault. So, in, in Fords, you know, and I come from Ford land, uh, they would give you the codes separately. They'd say, okay, here's your... Uh, on-demand codes, you know, your hard faults, and here are your continuous codes, your memory faults. And typically, if you had a, an on-demand code, uh, you had the exact same code in memory. So when it when the fault happens, you know, it stores that code, turns on the light, and, uh, you know, so you see it in both. So how do we find out what fault type we have here? Um, sometimes uh, it's really obvious. So again, the the Chrysler current, you know, if you you're using Ytech and you bring up a list of the codes in the car, if it says active, it's a hard fault. If it says stored, it's a soft fault. If Ford shows in the on-demand self-test, then it's a hard fault. Uh, if it's only in the continuous or the memory self-test, then uh, it's a soft fault. Um, so GM, I think, uh, current is the word we're looking for. If it says it's current, then it's a hard fault. Uh, if it's not current, then it's a soft fault. So, um, but generically, you know, how do you tell if a, a fault is a hard fault or a soft fault? One really simple way of doing that is... Um, run your diagnostics, right? Write down or somehow record all of the diagnostic trouble codes that the vehicle has and then clear them. Um, drive it again, and if codes come back, they're hard faults, right? They, they exist right now. Uh, you know, it's a little risky because, you know, some problems only happen very occasionally. Uh, so you got a problem, say, with the, the catalytic converter or something like that. Uh, you might never hit the monitor entry conditions or, or an EVAP problem. So if you clear it and just go take it for a quick ride and it doesn't come back, that, that doesn't mean necessarily that it's a soft fault. Uh, so this is not foolproof. Um, sometimes, though, you know, you, you get a car, it comes in, it's got 25 different codes in it. And you have no idea what's going on with this. Maybe somebody was working on it. Maybe somebody had all kinds of, uh, maybe somebody just did an intake manifold or just dropped the engine in and they had everything unplugged with the key on. And so every code in the book is, is recorded on this vehicle. Where do you even start, right? So for me, where I start is maybe I want to write all these down. Uh, so I have that information in case I need to refer back to it. Um, but I I'm probably going to clear those 25 codes and then drive it. I don't think I'm getting all 25 of them back. Very unlikely. So whatever comes back first, I'm going to start there, right? And um, sometimes you fix one code, right? And whatever set that code, that same exact problem, set some of the other codes. That's been known to happen. So, you know, first one that comes out, diagnose and fix that. It, in doing so, you may, uh, you may fix the rest of them. So let's go on to the next slide here, you know. Uh, mentioning this with Ford, uh, Ford, Ford's a little strange. 
and I, I grew up on Ford. Actually, um, I grew up on on General Motors, really, when I was really younger. But the dealership I worked in was a Lincoln Mercury dealership. So uh, this really weirds people out, this whole Ford diagnostics thing. Uh, but I'm really used to it. So let's talk about it for a minute. Uh, they, they haven't really changed it much over the years. So uh, we have something called a key on engine off self test. And we have something called a key on engine running self test. And the key on engine off self test uh, is supposed to show you both hard faults and soft faults. So when you initiate this self test, you know, with the scan tool, you're asking the vehicle, the scan tool is not doing the test, you're asking the vehicle to initiate a test of itself. That's why it's called a self test. And so um, it will look at things right now. So you may hear the cooling fan run. You may hear solenoids clicking, relays clicking. Uh, it's actively testing uh, various components. And the, the key on engine off, obviously, it cannot test all components, right? So, you know, it can't check fuel control when the engine's off. It, it can't check EGR operation when the engine's off. Um, so there's there are limits to what key on engine off can give you. And so then the, the vehicle spits out, you know, just one blip uh, that tells the scan tool, you know, that, okay, that's the end of the hard faults, right? This is the things I looked at right now and, and codes I gave you for that. That's over. Everything after this is stuff that's in memory. And they call that continuous codes. And, you know, the continuous codes are uh, from the continuous self-test. In other words, as the vehicle was out there driving before you ever saw it, it's always running self-test whenever it's whenever the key's on, self-test is happening. So continuous codes are codes that happen during that. Um, on a Chrysler, uh, I mentioned this, this good trip counter. Um, if it's zero, that means we never have good trips. This is not a drug reference. Uh, it's a it's a hard fault. If we have you know one or more good trips, that means sometimes the vehicle goes down the road, the monitor runs, and it passes. Modern Chryslers, as you've all seen give you the terms active and stored. You know, uh, and GM uses the, the term current. I can't tell you really, I, I can't memorize every vehicle manufacturer. So I don't remember exactly what Volkswagen or BMW or Honda or Toyota or Kia uh, uses for that terminology. Typically, it's kind of obvious. If you looked at something that said active or stored, I think you would understand active means a uh, hard fault. So what do we do? You know, we, we get a bunch of diagnostic trouble codes. Uh, it, it only makes sense to go after hard faults first because uh, those are the things that there's something wrong right now, you know. So if you do a test uh, and you, you test the faulty circuit or faulty component, it's going to fail. And then you're going to know. So, um, and once you fix those, fix those, you may find uh, that all the other codes are, are gone. They don't come back. So, uh, you know, if you fixed all the hard faults and, you know, you still have soft faults that you haven't gotten rid of, uh, you can work on those, but um, you know most vehicles. Let's face it, most vehicles come in. If you're if you're working in the field, I'm not talking about if you have a project car. If you're working in the field, you know, most vehicles that come in, uh, for most people, especially if you're in a dealer and you're doing warranty stuff, that light popped on, they brought it in, right? So uh, you find one fault or one, maybe two codes, you know, not 15 of them. 
but uh, project vehicle or someone's had their their hands in it, uh, who knows? You know, so you, you just you got to start somewhere. Start with the hard faults, um, and just one at a time until everything's taken care of. Soft faults. The problem with those is uh, it might take a lot of road testing to recreate these things. I. I drove a customer's car for a week um, before the problem uh, showed its head, you know. So, and, and this wasn't, it wasn't an onboard diagnostic thing even. It was a uh, problem where the car would die. And it was, you know, it was older. It was in the 80s. So uh, there were no codes for what was happening. It just, the car would die on a guy. And uh, it took me a week of driving this customer's car. Finally, the, the night before I was going to, return it you know it was a sunday night i was going to go back monday morning and tell the service writer you know call this customer and say i, I can't make it happen it just won't it won't fail for me it runs fine every time and uh sunday night i was out somewhere i went to go home and i went to start it and it wouldn't start and so uh I opened the hood and I had my wife crank the car over and I noticed that the, uh, the power relay for the PCM, what well, they used to call it the EEC, Electronic Engine Control Power Relay, uh, there, it was, you could see arcing going on inside of it or underneath it or whatever. And so I literally slapped the thing with my hand and the, the vehicle roared to life. And, you know, the problem never happened again. Uh, on the on the ride home or going into work the next morning but at least now i knew where to look you know it took a week um, i know some shops they they'll take a lot boy or uh, somebody and send them out driving right here just take this car and put some miles on it you know because we're trying to see if a problem is fixed uh, some vehicles you know i think and I hate to say this I really do I hate to say this I don't like the idea of returning a, a vehicle to a customer without absolutely knowing that you fixed the problem but let's look at an example all right uh, evap code you uh, you find you know a, a pretty obvious or something you're pretty certain fixed it so what's really common for a, a leak on an evap you know an evap code uh vent solenoid vent solenoids are usually in pretty unfriendly locations you know back in wheel wells and things like that uh so they don't live in a nice environment uh, they have a fairly high failure rate uh so you test it and you realize that it's not sealing when you energize it you know so there you go, you got pretty good evidence that that's the problem. So you replace it. Now what do you do? Um, really, if you're following the, the repair procedure exactly, you know, best practices, right? You, uh, you keep this vehicle and run it until the EVAP monitor runs and passes. Well, I've seen cars go a whole week without the EVAP monitor running. You know, the standards that have to be met for that EVAP monitor to run, they can be difficult. You need certain temperatures, you need the fuel level to be between, you know, I think 15 and 85%. Uh, you know, you, you can't, um, it has to be a uh, overnight, like a cold soak, it's got to sit without, you know, without sloshing fuel around. It's got to sit still overnight, um, and on and on. And we're gonna, we're actually gonna, we're gonna run through the list of enabling criteria, what it takes for that monitor to run. But yeah, it it goes on and on. And so, you you could have a car uh, for days, a customer's car that you have repaired. You're not positive it's repaired. You're pretty sure it's repaired. You can have it for days uh, just to make that EVAP monitor run. In the meantime, you got the guy in a rental or or worse, you know, the customer is uh, having to get rides to and from work. <clears throat> so in a case like that, uh, you you may need to let the customer be the one that, you know, <clears throat> that handles 
this right here, right? Significant road testing. I don't like it. Uh, it's not my favorite way of doing things, but um, it it may be required. So, um, it's just something you may have to do. All right. So, let's look at uh, OBD1 uh, self-test procedure, right? So I've just talked about this. On-demand test and continuous self-test. Um, both are run by the vehicle computer, not by the scan tool. Although the on-demand self-test, which is kind of a Ford term, that is uh, a test that is requested by the scan tool. So you've got the scan tool plugged into the vehicle computer and uh, you request the self-test. The, the vehicle itself runs the test. Um, the continuous self-test, it occurs while the vehicle is being operated normally. So this is what's happening when the customer has the car, right? So before you ever see it, every mile it drives, that diagnostic is just looping over and over and over again. And uh, every time the correct enable criteria happen for a monitor, you know, that monitor will run. Uh, and a lot of monitors, you know, they'll just run once and then they won't run again until the next time you drive the vehicle, next time the enable criteria are met. So on this on-demand test, I was talking about the Ford, you know, you, you do the key on engine off test. Um, it, it cannot test its ability to control RPM if the engine's not running, right? So can it energize an idle air control valve or can it uh, move the throttle plate and watch the throttle position sensor? It can do that, yeah. Uh, but can it test its ability to accurately control RPM? Not only if the engine's running, right? Um, exhaust gas recirculation. If there's no exhaust gas flowing, there's no way that it can realistically test whether the exhaust gas recirculation system is running. And uh, same with the oxygen sensors. You know, a typical oxygen sensor on-demand test might be uh, the, the computer intentionally drives the, uh, the system rich and drives the system lean and looks for the appropriate response from the oxygen sensor. What else? Uh, you know, one thing I think of is variable valve timing, right? It needs, uh, needs the engine to be running, needs that oil flow. Uh, so it can energize cam phaser solenoids and then look at uh, cam position sensors to see if, if that cam is moving the way it's supposed to, advancing the way it's supposed to. So, you know, these are things that, you know, you can ask the computer to do the test, but it can only do them when the engine's running. So in Ford land, you know, you do both. You do a key on engine off test, and, and then after that, you do a key on engine running test, and some things only show up on the key on engine running test. So uh, how does the on-demand self-test work? Uh, so you uh, request a test through a scan tool. The vehicle runs through a series of test steps, and... Most of you have seen this at least once. If you're doing an engine running self-test on a Ford, there are certain sensors that cannot be tested automatically. Um, I'll give you three examples. Brake pedal switch. Um, the vehicle will ask you, or the test procedure will ask you, to get in the vehicle and step on the brake pedal at some point during the self-test. So what does that do? That allows the, uh, the computer to see if it sees an input from the brake pedal switch. Uh, second one, overdrive cancel switch, usually on the shifter, the overdrive off button. Unless the driver pushes this button, the computer has no way of knowing whether it works. And the other is a power steering pressure switch. Um, the technician has to turn the steering wheel 
that causes the power steering pressure to go up. The computer is able to see that switch switch and knows that the power steering pressure switch is working. So, uh, like I say, Fords are a little bit weird. Um, they will have you initiate the self-test, and then it'll tell you, step on the brakes, twist the steering wheel, hit the overdrive, cancel switch. And you only have to do it once. You know, um, If you don't, then it will uh, come up with failures for those switches because it never saw any kind of uh, you know, change on that switch. So this uh, on-demand test is not for intermittent problems. So the, the problem has to exist while the test is running for this test to catch it. Um, so last slide we'll do for today, continuous self-test. This is just part of the normal operating program of the computer. So as the car is going down the road, you know, it looks at, uh, let's say it looks at, um, coolant temperature and it expects to see it a couple things it might expect it might expect to see it uh, always between certain numbers so it never expects to see you know 100 degrees below zero it never expects to see 500 degrees Fahrenheit right so it has a range that it considers normal um, so it's looking at every time it looks at the reading it's going to do that check well is this a is this reading make sense even you know is it one of the readings I could possibly expect from this sensor. Another thing it might look at is, uh, okay, the engine's been running for 10 minutes and my coolant temperature is still 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Something about that isn't right, you know? So um, this is just as it's running down the road, right? It never expects to see the coolant temperature go up and up and up and, you know, hit 190 and then all of a sudden be 100 again immediately. So that would be weird. So it's just, every time it looks at the reading, it's trying to decide if the reading actually makes sense, if it fits normal operation. And if not, you know, that's when it flags it uh, and potentially sets a code and turns on the light. So it's constantly monitoring various readings, you know, same with throttle position, uh, you know, uh, maybe the normal range for that, the uh, the voltage off of that is maybe it expects to see somewhere between 0.5 and 4.5. If it sees zero or if it sees five, it knows something's wrong. Yeah. And just every time it looks at that, that sensor reading, which is, you know, multiple times per second, it's going to compare it to a, a bunch of known good values. And if it doesn't fall in that uh, range, it'll flag it as a problem. So if something does fail, um, the computer may, may store a diagnostic trouble code. Okay, so um, a lot of self-tests require multiple failures before they'll set a code. Uh, I think this is done so tiny little glitches that really have no effect on the operation of the vehicle don't give you a bunch of nuisance check engine lights. Um, you'd be chasing after ghosts all the time. Um, so they may store a code, they may turn on a malfunction indicator, uh, and they may alter normal vehicle or system operation to compensate for the failure. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, if a car has a transmission oil temperature sensor, you know, what's the purpose of that? Well, if the transmission oil temperature gets too hot, then uh, you may have transmission failure. So uh, let's say that I'm the computer and I'm watching the transmission oil temperature and I lose that reading. I lose that signal or it goes completely wacky, something that, that can't be right. Um, now I have no idea what the transmission oil temperature is. Oh, my goodness, is my transmission in, in trouble? Right? So there may be steps programmed in in the event of a failure of that sensor that do things like kick the cooling fan on. Um, we're trying to bring down the oil temperature. You know, there's a, usually a transmission oil cooler built into the radiator or near the radiator, right? So kick the cooling fan on. Um, maybe kick up the idle speed because that increases the, the flow through that cooler. Uh, 
maybe alter a torque converter clutch operation because torque converters generate a whole lot of heat when they're slipping and very little heat when they're not. So uh, maybe I lock that clutch up more. You know? Maybe alter the shift scheduling. Um, you know, so in addition to just turning a light on, there may be uh, operational strategies that are used to try to make sure that the, uh, the thing doesn't cook. Yeah, most cars, you can do this yourself. You can see it. You pull the, the wiring connector off the engine coolant temperature sensor or a cylinder head temperature sensor. Instantaneously, the cooling fan kicks on high speed. Why is that? Because now it has no idea if the engine's overheating. So it has to assume the worst, kick the fan on, and you know go into this protect mode. So... This continuous self-test uh, has been around since OBD1. Um, in OBD2, it's called the Comprehensive Component Monitor. So it, it, anything that doesn't fit under these other monitors that we're going to list, like Catalyst or EGR or Fuel System or whatever, any of these other, you know, we're just going to call it the Comprehensive Component Monitor. So it's doing a check of all the rest of the components of the vehicle. All right. So, um, we're on, uh, we're on, uh, yeah, I guess we're far enough in that uh, I feel we can stop now. This is enough for one week. Uh, I will come up with uh, a quiz again on Blackboard, 10 questions. Uh, it'll be right below this video on Blackboard. So uh, I won't keep it up there forever. I usually like to keep them up about a week. So you know, it's Thursday. I'm posting this Thursday evening, Thursday late afternoon. Uh, the test will be up sometime tonight, Thursday. Uh, it's April 30th. I'll probably leave it up. I'll uh, give you all week to, to work on this. You'll have two shots at it. You know, it's just a 10-question quiz. Not a big deal. Um, but it's mostly... Uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen with the final exam. You know, I need enough grades here to make sure that you're, you know, receiving what I'm transmitting here. So, um, and I don't know if you paid any attention during this. Uh, put a little notes in here, here and there, but uh, there were a couple of strange things that, that happened uh, that Maybe I'll ask a question about, uh, such as, you know, where exactly in the video did that happen or what happened? And uh, just making sure you're paying attention. And uh, also, you know, this gets boring. So just uh, trying to have a little bit of fun too. So um, good luck on the quiz. And I'll have something else in a week. We'll continue on these slides. These slides are on Blackboard. Uh, so you can look ahead if you want. You can look back through them. You can see everything I, that I looked at there. And uh, we'll continue with those uh, next week.